but as as you explore, I mean, there's other costs that came in that were unant- unanticipated, I would imagine, by most people. And so instead of, say, everybody um, doing very well in a very prosperous year where the, the crop, the yield was great, and everybody's, okay, we're doing good this year. And then five years later, there's a drought and there's some devastating, something comes through and it, it causes all the crops to basically fail. And in a sense, the whole, I mean, I've, I could be wrong here, but it, sense, it seems to me in that context, the whole whole community would be um, maybe reeling and maybe attempting, at least in a collective sense, trying to, you know, get their way through that year. Um, so everybody's sort of suffering collectively. But if you have more of a capitalist relationship, if you have this idea we're growing this crop on this land and it's individualized, certain people are going to be doing very well and are going to increasingly do better as other people fail, right? Because you could come in and take their land and say, okay, you're not using this well and yeah, sell it to me. Um, So then it seems then that people are still suffering, (laughs) but they're suffering on a much more isolated, in a much more isolated and uh, individualized way. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you know, again, you're really astute, Patrick, you've got right to the heart of it. Um, This is endemic in capitalism, right? I mean, we, we tell these rags to riches stories, you know, the American dream, um, this idea that you can make it if you try, right? We torture people with the idea that through their own initiative and hard work, they too could make it. And if they don't make it, it's because they were not smart enough or hardworking enough, right? And so this is, this, is the, uh, this is the ideology of capitalism, which suggests, you know, for me, I use the term ideology uh, to, in a kind of a specific way. For me, it's the, it's the story you tell to justify inequality. Um, so in, in capitalism, the story we tell is this one, right? It's the story of the meritocracy. And it's a story. It's not actually supported by the data. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you, if you look at um, transmission, you know, Piketty and others have shown this dramatically, right? If you look at the data on intergenerational transmission of wealth, advantage, uh, etc., that's the big story. It has nothing to do with meritocracy or rags to riches. But we tell this story and we torture people with it and we teach it to them in schools. Like, I think it's a catastrophe. You know, I, schools are full of it. They're full of um, like everybody, even a seven year old is supposed to be an entrepreneur, you know, and, and they're, they're celebrated. I think, what are you doing telling children that they have to be little capitalists and that that's, that's their future um, path to not just to wealth, but to being valued as a contributor to society. I think it's horrible, but it's, the world is absolutely full of it. We, right now we've got, you know, entrepreneurialism being taught to in kindergarten. Yeah. Um, so we've, <laughs> we've intensified this myth um, to, to such a, an extent that, um, I mean, there's really a problem. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think, these Highlanders, you know, they were, um, you know, going back to that story, you know, like I said, they, they didn't have a kind of a worked out uh, sort of customary ethic of egalitarianism. You know, one should share, everyone should be equal. And that's because they lived on the land frontier. And so for them, um, lazy people have small fields. And, you know, really hardworking, dynamic people have big ones and they get more. Right. So for them, it was very obvious and physical and embodied that the hardworking and smart farmer would be more successful than the lazy one who made bad decisions. So they they had a version of um, meritocracy. But you could say that it was actually supported by their environment because it is true in that case. That if you, you know, you work harder, you get the rewards. But it was completely untrue after Coco. They, that way of thinking, you know, is one of those kind of morphings, right? They retained that way of thinking. They would say things like, 
yeah, well, they, they, the people, my cousins over there who've ended up landless, that's because they're lazy. But, you know, it, it, you know, said cousins were dying to work, needed to work. Um, but there was no work for them, right? So it wasn't that they were lazy, right? So that you, you've sort of taken a, a myth, you know, which actually reflected a prior reality and applied it to a new set of conditions in which by that stage, I would say it was functioning as ideology, not as a description. So, um, you know, I, I think those kinds of more things went on there. It was fascinating to see, and it wasn't um, hegemonic, right? There were some people who had a counter narrative who would say, no, it's not that, you know, I, I'm a hardworking person. I've worked hard all my life, but, you know, I inherited very little from my parents and, and, and this is my life. It's a hard life. You know, people were very, had a good understanding of the sort of structural conditions of their own impoverishment. Um, but they were, uh, um, and not surprisingly, um, it was more the successful people who had, uh, who told stories about laziness. Um, there's a, um, but that, but we do this too, right? You know, this, this idea that you can make it if you try is primarily an ideology re repeated by rich people um, because it's, for them, it's the narrative which justifies and legitimates their own wealth you know, as being the outcome of their diligence and savvy, et cetera. Um, poor people are often tortured by this kind of idea, and sometimes they repeat it, but they often have a pretty strong notion that there's something wrong with that picture.